humans must never submit to animals. The Lady Jessica Atreides Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of man's mind. The Orange Catholic Bible Our introduction to the universe of Dune takes place in Paul Atreides' bedchamber in the ducal palace of his home planet, Caladan. There, we meet Paul himself, his mother, the Lady Jessica, and the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mahayam, along with her infamous Gom Jabbar. With the relocation of House Atreides to Arrakis imminent, the Reverend Mother has come to test Paul before he matures and accrues power. She must determine if he is fully human, and if not, she will kill him. Her test is crisis and observation. She wants to know if Paul can use his will to override his instincts and remain focused while his reflexes are screaming at him to flee. If Paul can willingly endure excruciating pain to survive, he will prove that he understands consequences. An animal does not understand consequences. To prepare himself, Paul silently recites one of the Bene Gesserit lessons learned from his mother. To be conscious by choice. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment. Animal pleasures remain close to sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which to see his universe. Focus consciousness by choice. This forms your grid. Having passed the test, Paul is furious at having been put through such agony. He wants answers. The Reverend Mother is disdainful. Pain. She sniffs. A human can override any nerve in the body. Her response, along with Paul's mantra, encapsulate the essence of the conscious human self that Frank Herbert is addressing in Dune. The first of the three concerns that occupy human life, according to Leto II. The conscious self, which Herbert calls quintessentially human, is above all else a creative force, which can conceive of new things and bring them into being. It is unbounded in ways that other life forms are not, yet it does not operate in a complete void. It requires a framework of ideas to function, a grid or context within which it can organize itself. It self-generates this grid through perception, experience and thought, using what is known to help probe into the unknown. Finally, and perhaps most crucially, the human self can tame and overrule its more primitive animal self. The Kwisatz Haderach, Paul Muad'Dib, describes this ability to control our instinctive urges thus. The Fremen were supreme in the self-imposed delay between desire for a thing and the act of reaching out to grasp that thing. From the Wisdom of Muad'Dib by the Princess Irulan. The power to direct our actions through our ideas rather than by automatic response allows us to accomplish complex, planned tasks and connected sequences of activity to create the new. For example, with training and repetition, we can learn to make sharp cutting blades from stone pebbles. We are not born with this ability, but we can learn it. And by learning it, we not only enhance our ability to survive, but we expand our consciousness to understand that objects can be shaped by our hands and imagination. And from there, we can produce a virtually unlimited range of cutting tools using materials ranging from iron to laser light. Also, unlike animals, our self-awareness allows us to channel our instincts and emotions. We can apply the motivational impulse that our animal self produces any way we choose. As the Reverend Mother Mohayam says to Paul during the ordeal of the Gom Jabbar, You've heard of an animal chewing off a leg to escape a trap? There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. This attribute, the ability to apply willful intent, discipline and training to our animal powers, makes us formidable indeed. Apex Predator, yes, but also much more. In his landmark TV series, The Ascent of Man, Produced by the BBC in 1973, mathematician and philosopher Jacob Bronowski illustrates the mind-over-body paradigm by way of an athlete leaping, not for food, not for safety, 
but for sport. The violent coursing of the blood and intake of air. The main chemical action is to get energy for the muscles by burning sugar there. That, in one way or another, is the normal metabolism of an animal in flight. But there is a cardinal difference. The runner was not in flight. The shot that set him off was the starter's pistol, and what he was expecting, deliberately, was not fear, but exultation. The runner is like a child at play. His actions are an adventure in freedom, and the only purpose of his breathless chemistry was to explore the limits of his own strength. Naturally, there are physical differences between man and the other animals, even between man and the apes. Yet, such differences are secondary by comparison with the overriding difference, which is that the athlete is an adult, whose behavior is not driven by his immediate environment, as animal actions are. In themselves, his actions make no practical sense at all. They are an exercise that is not directed to the present. The athlete's mind is fixed ahead of him, building up his skill, and he vaults an imagination into the future. Poised for that leap, the pole vaulter is a capsule of human abilities. The grasp of the hand, the arch of the foot, the muscles of the shoulder and pelvis, the pole itself in which energy is stored and released like a bow firing an arrow. The radical character in that complex is the sense of foresight, that is, the ability to fix an objective ahead and rigorously hold his attention on it. The athlete's performance unfolds a continued plan, from one extreme to the other. It is the invention of the pole, the concentration of the mind at the moment before leaping, which give it the stamp of humanity. In this passage, Bronowski is reminding us that no other land animal on Earth can leap a 20-foot obstacle, yet humans can, because we can conceive of a way. By using a pole to leverage our mass and velocity, fashioning the pole correctly, practicing the precise movements required, and finally executing them in a perfect sequence to achieve something that we are not naturally capable of doing. When Paul says to himself, animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, he is referring to the same conscious process that Bronowski describes in the Paul Volta's leap, that of fixing a future goal in our minds and making it the objective of our body's actions. We use our will to focus our cognitive powers, so that we can act upon that which we conceive. But there is more. In the next quote, the Reverend Mother says, A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. Mahayam does not emphasize self-preservation here. Rather, she focuses on removing a threat to other humans. Herbert is pointing out that, much as we see ourselves first as individuals, a large part of our motivations, conscious or unconscious, are oriented towards the group. Humans have a built-in interest in the survival of our own kind. As a social species, much, if not all of our activities, are oriented to and by the group. We rely on our society to subsist, since most of our survival strategies are group activities from early big game hunting and agriculture to high-tech design and construction. Group survival is therefore a primary concern, and we are sensitive to external threats to our group's interests and assets, whatever they may be. Conscious control over our own nervous system and a concern for other humans beyond our own immediate kin, these, according to Muad'Dib's son, the Emperor Leto II, are two of the three hallmarks of humanity and the Reverend Mother has come to Caladan to ensure that no one who does not possess them ascends to a high position of power.